Hallelujah. You're welcome tonight in the name of Jesus. We are in afternoon here in Toronto. This is 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And I want to believe in West African. This is exactly 7 p.m. West African Time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you because of your mercy and your love and your grace. Thank you, Abba Father. For the privilege you've given unto us to be in your presence once again. I pray, Father, that as we share your word together, that your people will be blessed. You will anoint my tongue, and I will speak your intention in the name of Jesus. You will guide me so that your word will fill my mouth, and I will teach your word in simplicity and in accuracy to the glory of your name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everyone shout, Amen. You are welcome to our apostolic Bible study. Just like every Tuesday, I bring you the Word of God, teachings, doctrines that will be able to help and strengthen believers' faith. If you've been following us, uh, I put out a flyer for this week' activities. And our Bible study, the focus of our Bible study is to teach on a subject called Believers Walk with God. Believers Walk with God. When we become born again, one of the most important things we need to understand is to understand our walk with God. Uh, we're going to read some scripture today and it will Father bless us and uh, give us understanding. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. Believers walk with God. Second Corinthians chapter five. Then we read verse seven. Second Corinthians five, verse seven. Um, what the scripture says here is. For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith, W-A-L-K, and not by sight. We walk. Our walk is the walk of faith. It is not based on our senses. It is not based on our feelings. It is based on our faith. Um, that is a very important scripture to begin with. Paul the Apostles wrote a piece to, to the church at Corinth, sharing with them what is expected of them. And he said, when a man is born again, the next important thing he needs to do is to understand his work with God and what is required of him in his work with the Lord. This is very important for all child of God to understand that our walk with God is the next thing when we are, are joining with the Lord. Okay, so that is the first scripture. Then the second scripture we are going to read is First Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 1 to 7. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we want to look at the admonition of Paul Apostle to the church at Thessalonica and uh, what Paul explains to 
them. False chapter 4 from verse 1. Um, let me read it one more time. I want to read so that we can have understanding of today's subject. It's very important uh, when we are, are teaching the Bible. We need solid, solid uh, understanding of the scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 1 from verse 1 to 7. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exalt you by the Lord Jesus Christ, that as you have received us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you will abound more and more. Verse 2 says, For you know what commandment we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother, in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. Verse 7 says, For God has not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. This is beautiful and the admonition of Paul the Apostle to the church in Thessalonica. Now, in today's Bible study, we want to look at uh, having the understanding of what we call our walk with God. What does it mean when you hear the word believers walk with God? What does that mean? Now, the word believers walk with God means Believers is exploring God in Christ Jesus. It is only in Christ that you can understand God. There is no understanding that is given unto any man under the heaven to have the understanding of God outside the revelation of Christ. It therefore means since the time that Jesus Christ had come into the world through incarnation, and he had gone back to heaven through resurrection, we are only giving understanding within the scope of Christ. So when we are talking about believers walk with God, it simply means believers is exploring God in Christ Jesus. It means your journey with God, exploring all possibilities in God, that leads to exploit. Exploring all possibilities in God that leads to exploit. There are many realms in God and each realm in God defines his reality. That is why in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 the scripture lays emphasis and says, Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You must understand that it is only given unto us to understand God in Christ. So your walk with God simply means I am exploring all possibilities in God in Christ Jesus. The book of Daniel said the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploit. It therefore means, believers walk with God means journeying, making journeying with God in Christ Jesus. It therefore means that it is not possible for you to walk with God except you are in Christ. It is not possible to walk with God except you are in Christ. You must know the difference between W-O-R-K and W-A-L-K. Now, the journey of every believer starts 
by the saving grace of God. There are three expressions of the grace of God in the New Testament. It is the saving grace, it is the serving grace, and it is also the enduring grace. The saving grace is in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For by grace you are saved, and it is not your work, lest any man should boast. So saving grace is the grace through which we are saved. It is not on us, it is on Christ. It is the finished work of Jesus that through that finished work of Jesus, we have access to the gift of salvation. Now that you are born again by the saving grace of God, then the expression of that grace is not just on the saving terms. The expression of that grace is also on the saving terms. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, I therefore beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the grace through which we are saved, the expressions of that grace also further helps us to serve God in a local church. Grace through which you are saved by faith is the same expressions of grace through which you serve God in a local church. It is the same grace through which you serve one another, according to Romans chapter 12. It is the same grace through you which you serve the will of God in your generation. So when you are saved by grace through faith, it is the gift of God. Therefore, the expressions of this grace also manifest as a service. You serve God in a local church, identify with a local church, and you begin to serve the Lord. In the same serving capacity, the same grace is commissioned you to also serve one another, be as one another's body. You must also understand that it is the same grace through which you serve the will of God in your generation. Just as the Bible says that David served the will of God in his generation. So therefore means that we have the saving grace, we have the serving grace, then we have the enduring grace. The enduring grace is what the scripture says in the book of Matthew, that he that endureth till the end shall be saved. Second Timothy chapter 2 says, My son Timothy endure. It says, it says, be strong in the grace that is given unto you in Christ Jesus. And he said, one more time, endure hardship as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. You must let the expressions of the grace of God upon your life move from the saving grace to the serving grace. And it also moves mature from serving grace to enduring grace. When the grace of God begins to function in the life of a man as an enduring grace, it gives you the ability to endure persecution. It gives you the ability to endure the process of the dealings of God with you. It also gives you the ability to endure hardness. Hardness. The Bible call it hardness. The Greek word for hardness means solid training solid training. There are so many things God wants to do in your life. It will take enduring grace to endure the process of the dealings of God with you. So you must understand that the same grace of God through which you are saved, that same grace is committed into your life to serve the Lord. And that same grace is committed into your life to endure the process and the dealings of God with you. Now, still on this subject I'm dealing with today, believers' walk with God is the practical Christian life through which we love the Lord, we serve the Lord, and we bear fruit of righteousness. So when you are born again, God 
dwells in you. When you are born again, God dwells in you by his spirit. But when you submit to God, God is walking in you. The reality of God in the life of a believer begins as the dwelling reality. That simply means when a man comes to Christ, God lives in him. He that is, he that is born again is of one spirit with the Lord. When you are born again, God lives in you. God dwells in you. Now your body is the temple of the Lord because God lives in you. But that is not all what God wants to become in your life. God does just not want to dwell in you by the Spirit. God also wants to walk in you. To walk in you simply means to take you into dimensions, in, to give you different expressions, to produce certain things in your life that will become evident, especially it becomes the fruit of righteousness. So God dwells in a man, God walks in a man, and God is walking through a man. When God is walking through you, it simply means it makes you a blessing to the body of Christ. When God dwells in you, he dwells in you because you are saved. When God walks in you, he walks in you because you submit to his ordinances and you submit to his understanding, you submit to his precepts, and you submit to his word. But when God is walking through you, when God is walking through you, he is making you a vessel unto honor in the hand of the Lord, revealing God's intention through you. It therefore means God gives you a ministry through which he manifests himself in your life. So you must know that God dwelling in a man and God walking in a man is not on the same level. Now, in today's subject, we're going to continue. When we talk about believers' walk with God, there are three positions in which believers are written in the scripture. When you are reading the Bible, you read Bible in understanding, and then you read Bible with your eyes being enlightened. There are three positions that believers maintain in Christ. One, believers are seated with Christ. We have a sitting position with Christ. This sitting position is the position of rest. This sitting position is the position of rest. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 10 emphasizes that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places far above principalities and power. So believers have a sitting, sitting position with Christ. Our position with Christ, which emphasizes the sitting position, is the position of rest. It is an honorary position given to those who are born again. And that position connotes rest. You must understand that we have a seat with Christ. Why do we have a seat with Christ? Because when Christ died, the Bible says we die with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. When he resurrected, we are resurrected with him. When he ascended, we ascended with him. When he seated, we are seated with him. This position given unto us as believers, it is the highest position that can be given to any man who is in Christ Jesus. It is honorary. It is the expressions of our rest through the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this position is settled. And in this position which we call believers are seated with Christ, there are three important verbs that can use to illustrate these positions. And these verbs are can, C-A-N, H-A-V-E, have, has, and had. Whenever you read in the New Testament, when the Bible says, Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us, it simply shows us 
that our honorary position in Christ are not subject to change. We are blessed. That cannot be altered. We are seated with him in heavenly places. It cannot equally be altered. And then we have access to the throne of grace. It cannot be altered. We come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find help in time of need. It cannot also be altered. The provision of Jesus Christ for us in the New Testament cannot be altered because they are eternal provisions. And you must understand that when the scripture says that believers are seated with Christ, the position of rest has been given unto us through the finished work of Christ. That is not only the positions that exist in Christ for believers. The second position is what we call believer standing position. Believer standing position. Now, the believer standing position explains what and who we believe. It explains what and who we believe. Who do we believe? What are we standing upon? We are standing on the solid rock. The Bible says that rock is Christ. That is our stand. Our stand is an expression of what we believe and who we believe. When Paul the Apostle began to say something in the book of Romans chapter 8, and he said, What shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall death, shall persecution? He said, In all these things we are more than conquerors. He said, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things to come, nor things absent, will be able to separate me from the love of Christ. Our position in Christ is not just a sitting position. We also have a standing position. A standing position is a position of affirmation, a position of belief, a position of conviction, a profession of revelation. We are standing on the revelation of Christ. Standing of who Christ is, what we have been made in Christ, that is our stand. You must take your stand of who you are in Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walks not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now have this understanding very well. Everything you go through does not change your position in Christ. Everything you are going through does not change your perspective in Christ. You must understand that taking your standing position, it requires your effort. Your sitting position does not require your effort, but your standing position it requires your effort under the administration of grace and truth. You don't have to let the devil convince you that you are not of God. He says, little children, you are of God, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. First John chapter 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So you need to understand this truth tonight that our standing position connotes that we maintain our faith, exercise our belief, exercise our conviction, giving expressions to what we believe and who we believe will help you to take your stand. We stand on Christ who is the solid rock. We stand on God's promises we are standing on his word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass without being fulfilled. You need to have this understanding today that your work with God is very, very important. The third position we maintain is our walking position. Believers walk. It is a journey from one realm to another. When it comes to our walking position, our walking position is the exploration. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, As we behold him with an unveiled face like in a glass, 
we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory even by the spirit of god so understand that believers walk is a journey from one realms of reality to another believers walk with god is only possible in christ because we are exploring god in christ jesus all right let's look at what is required of you if you are going to walk with god as a believer what is required of you to walk with god number one believers walk with god requires life colossians chapter 2 verse 6 write it down dead people cannot walk with god dead people cannot walk with god so to walk with god the life of god must be present within your born again spirit before your walk with God is possible. Romans chapter 6 verse 11. It also emphasizes the truth. The Bible says you that you were dead in your trespass. Ephesians 2 verse 1. It says now by the blood of Jesus you've been made near. You that you are stranger. You are now partakers of the commonwealth of Zion. This explains to you. That there is nobody that can walk with God if it doesn't have the life of God. The life of God is only manifested in Christ Jesus. That life is what we call eternal life. It is what we call Zohe, the life of God. That life of God is full of immortality and it is full of light. So believers walk with God requires life. Number two is walking with God requires growth. For if you are not growing, you cannot walk with God. The Bible says in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, As a newborn babe desires sincere milk, that he may grow thereby. Newborn babes cannot walk with God, though they have life. A newborn baby must desire to walk by being properly led, fed, and with sincere milk. The Bible calls it sincere milk. Because not every meek can result to the growth in the body of a baby. When a baby is just born, they call it nanwan. Nanwan is responsible for the growth of a baby, the formation of the brain and the muscles and the body. Why? Because the proper feeding is what results to proper growth. The systems of feeding believers will also tell in the work of believers with God. If you are not properly fed, you will not properly grow. And if you don't properly grow, there are some things you can't handle in the journeys of life. That is why we have a lot of believers who are genuinely saved, but their growth is not coming. The growth is not forthcoming because there are nothing through which they can grow. So in the absence of sincere milk, in the absence of solid meats and in the absence of stronger bones, growth is not visible in the Christian life of a believer. So to grow with the Lord, to walk with God, you need to grow up. In fact, the book Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and let us go unto maturity. Let's go unto perfection because you will need to grow. You will need to grow and you will need to go. So your walk with God requires growth. Don't forget that when you have self-will and disobedience, it will affect your walk with God. The only thing that affects your walk with God, it is your self-will and disobedience. It will disturb and it will hinder the program of God for your life as regards your spiritual growth. Number three, to walk with God requires liberty. To walk with God requires liberty. Psalm 119 verse 45, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17, Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It therefore simply means the area where we have to be very careful is that we must not let the church system 
hinder the freedom and the liberty of people from walking with God. If there is anything that has actually paralyzed the work of believers with God today, there are certain rules and regulations and systems that are not in accordance with the revelation of the scripture. You see, when you make a church rules and system that are direct hindrance to the growth of believers, then the church system becomes more powerful than the integrity of scripture. This area must be dealt with because nobody will work with God except we give them that access to express themselves in the presence of the Lord. You may find yourself in a local church where they don't drum. You may find yourself in a local church where they don't clap. That liberty must be given to everyone so that everybody exercise their understanding as regard their worship with the Lord. So walking with God requires liberty. Don't forget when Lazarus was raised from the dead. The Bible says that even though he was raised from the dead by the power of resurrection of Jesus, he was still bound foot and hands. His hands and feet were still bound. And Jesus spoke unto the people, Loose him and let him go. When you are born again, it's a demonstration of resurrection power. But if you are going to grow in the Lord and you are going to walk with Christ, you must be loosed. Your hands must be loosed. Your feet must be loosed. Because your hands and your feet, they are expressions of different positions that confirmed the manifestations of your liberty. Jesus didn't lose Lazarus. He didn't lose his hand and his feet. And there is a reason why he did that. He said, I am the resurrection and life, but I have committed into the hands of my disciples the ministry of reconciliation and deliverance. So therefore, what we are doing as believers, what we are doing as minister, is that after the life of Jesus has raised them from their dead, then through the teaching and discipleship, we can release them into the fullness of God. We can loose their feet and loose their hands and let them express the liberty through which Christ has purchased for them by his own blood. Don't forget that the price for our redemption is the blood of Jesus Christ. So walking with God requires liberty. Very, very important. People's opinion must not hinder your walk with God. Your walk with God is a spiritual walk. It requires walking in the light. When you hear that believers are walking with God, that is only possible in Christ Jesus. Your walk with God is only possible in Christ because in Christ we explore all the possibility and every manifestation of God are already conditions in Christ Jesus. So the fourth thing that requires of you when you are walking with God is to walk in with God requires light. When we we'll talk about light, First John chapter 1, verse 7, walk in the light as he is in the light. Psalm 119, verse 105, the entrance of your word giveth light, and it giveth understanding to those who are simple. What is light? Light is revelation knowledge. Light is revelation knowledge. Light is revelation knowledge. When we are born again, we are equal in salvation. But when it comes into the light of God, we are not equal in the understanding through light. It therefore means the light of God produces perspective. The light of God produces conviction. The light of God produces affirmation. The, life of God, the light of God produces coordination. The light of God produces understanding. The entrance of your word will give light. And that light produces understanding. So what does that mean? It simply means that if you are not walking in light, you are not walking with God. God's word is light. Anointing fire the word of God is light, 
Why the Holy Ghost produces fire, the Word of God produces light. In Matthew chapter 3, the Bible says that it's coming after me, is greater than high, who swear I cannot wear, it shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. The Holy Ghost, the temperature of the Holy Spirit is fire. Everywhere the Spirit of God is present, fire is the expressions of the Spirit. But the expressions of the Word of God is light. So you have to burn and you have to shine. Shining and burning are the expressions of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. John chapter 6 verse 63, it is the Spirit that quickens, the flesh profit nothing. The Word I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So in the area of your Christian life, where you have light is the area of your Christian life you will have testimony. Not every aspect of your Christian faith, that uh, every aspect of your Christian faith requires the measure of light. Your finance, your relationship, your emotional life, your service unto God, your academic, all these areas of your life requires the impute of light. Without light, you will walk in darkness, even though you are born again, but you will walk in darkness in certain areas of your faith. You can walk in darkness as regards your finance if the light of God does not shine there. You can walk in darkness as regards your marriage if the light of God does not shine there. You can walk in darkness as regards ministry if the light of God does not shine there. So in the area of your Christian faith, where you have light is the area where you will have testimony. You will have the workings of the operations of the Spirit because you submit to the ordinance of light. All right, so walking with God requires light. Number five, your walk with God requires progress. There are many realms in God. Each realm defines his reality. First Timothy chapter 4 Verse 15 also emphasizes, and uh, the Paul admonition to Timothy, he said, Timothy, you have to grow up so that people can see your progress in Christ. You have to make progress in Christ. Things that always distract you, by the time you make progress, they are no longer your distraction. Offense, you are above offense. You are above gossip. You are both discouragement because you have made progress beyond that level. You are beyond the level that if people doesn't ask you whether you come to church, you will go. You are above that level. So in your work with God also requires progress. Very important. And you can measure your progress in Christ by knowing certain things in your life that you have overcome. You have overcome you have overcome unforgiveness. You have overcome gossip, malice. You have overcome prayerlessness. That means prayer life is no longer about location. Wherever you find yourself, nothing should stop the manifestation of your prayer. You are so making progress that you are praying both in the spirit and you are also praying in understanding. You are making progress because you can actually track the manifestations of the Spirit of God in your life. How do you know you are making progress? The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. So everything the Spirit of God searches out from God, He relates those things to you. And the process of knowing those truths is what the Bible refers to as revelation. That is why I define revelation as the walking knowledge of truth. It is the disclosure of the realities of God that is passed across into your spirit by the power of God's word and by the power of the Holy Ghost. You need to understand this reality I'm sharing with you today that you cannot, it is impossible for you to enjoy your Christian life if you are not making progress. The issue of seduction, you can overcome it. Lustfulness, you can overcome it. Manipulation, you can overcome it. Why do I know? Because if you make progress, there are certain things that are object of distractions to you in times past. But now, 
maturity has taken place. Paul the Apostle said, when I was a child, I think like a child. I talk like a child. I reason like a child. So your thinking, your talking, your reasoning are the expressions of your growth. Because if you are making progress, it will affect your mindset. It will affect your thinking faculty. It will affect your talking ability. And it will also affect your reasoning ability. So understand this very, very important. The sixth area, what is required of you in walking with God is that walking with God requires balance. Balance. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Walking with God requires balance. This is an area where I'm having, uh, excuse me one minute. Right. This is an area where I'm having a lot of concern for believers that has the desire, have the desire to grow up in Christ. Walking with God requires balance. Now, let me say this to you, very important. When you are born again, whoever desire puts you, whichever type of church you go, Whichever types of friend you make in Christ has a strong contribution to your balance or imbalances as believer. Your local church is going to play a great role in your being balanced. Your fellowship with God will make a contribution. The friend you deliberately choose will make a contribution. And also who disciples you will also make on con your contribution. And why do I say so? I say so because balance is very important in our Christian work. If you are out of balance, you will not your work with God will have K leg. If you are out of balance, your work with God will be questioned. And if you are going to become a balanced believer, you must be balanced in practice, spiritual practices. Every belief will result to conviction, and every conviction will result to practice. Every practice will result to culture, and every culture will have impact in the society. So if you are out of balance, for example, if you don't understand the balance as regard prayer, you may go beyond what is balance and enter into spiritism. You may be out of balance when it comes to giving. You can give to the point that you become broke. When you are out of balance in marriage, you don't even understand how to honor your wife. When you are out of balance as regard ministry, you may put ministry before marriage. So you see you have believers who are not trained, they are not tutored, they are not taught, and they are not properly disciples. And as a result of improper teachings, and discipleship process has actually led to all kinds of imbalances in their practice as a believer. So balance in practice. The practice of your Christian faith requires a balanced work. You must also be balanced in perspective. You must be balanced in conviction. You must be balanced in affirmation. You must be balanced in service. You must be balanced in doctrine, and you must also be balanced in your way of life. Okay, so very important. As you grow up in Christ, and as your work with God becomes very solid, a time is going to come when the fruit of a balanced Christian life begin to manifest in your life. When you see an overemphasis, or when people overemphasize a subject of the Bible at the expense of another subject, it is because the pastor is not balanced. Many people take prophetic too far. Many people take prophetic too far and then is out of balance. Many people take speaking in tongues out of balance. Many takes prayer out of balance. And many also takes 
the things of the spirit out of balance. Now, number seven is walking with God requires faith and love. The walk, your walk with God requires faith and love. Hebrew chapter 11 verse 1, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Hebrew 11 verse 6, he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you don't have faith, your work with God is not possible. Why? Because God is spirit. Why do you need faith? You need faith to walk with someone you don't see with your natural eyes. Especially somebody you have to perceive. Somebody you have to know. Somebody you have to study. Somebody you have to learn. Somebody you have to design. It requires expressions of faith to be able to walk with God. So faith is the evidence of things not seen. Love is very important. The love of God is one of the greatest things the devil can try to steal out of your heart. The moment you are born again, Romans chapter 5 verse 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. So the love of God is given unto us whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That ability to cry, Abba, Father, is because the love of God dwells in you. First John chapter 5 verse 17, Whosoever love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So when you are born again, the love of the Father is a seed that is dropped into your spirit. That love is shed abroad in your heart. The Holy Spirit made sure that the love of God is released into your spirit so that the consciousness of God becomes automatic in your inner man. But you must grow in love. You must walk in love. Don't let hate dominate your mind. Forgive those who have offended you. The Bible says so. The Bible also admonishes us that if it is possible, we live peaceably with all men. Why is this love very important? Because without the love of God, you cannot be drawn to the Father. Number two, without the love of God, Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 cannot be possible. What does the Bible say in Colossians 3 verse 1? If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ seated, set your affection on the things above, and not on the things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So without God's love, you can't be drawn to the Father. You can't love Him. You can't love everything about Him. And if you don't love, if you are not walking in love, you will not manifest, experience the depth of the Father's reality. And why do we have to love God? Because love keeps us going irrespective of circumstances you are going through. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. The love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. And through the abundance of this love that reside in our spirit, then we love one another. Because if you don't love one another, how do you will you love the one that you do not see? If you hate someone you see, how come you want to claim you love someone that you do not see? So Satan will try to separate you from God's love, which is only expressed in Christ. Jesus. The Bible also says in Galatians chapter 5 16, it says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, on today's subject, as I'm rounding up in the next 10 minutes, believers walk with God. What does that explain again? The word walk, W A L K, it is to make one way, to make progress and to make use of opportunity. It also means to explore God in Christ. Christ is the only context through which we explore God. So if that means it is to follow God, to follow Christ, which leads to the proof of our ability. 
we to exercise in order to build spiritual muscle. All these are also the compound word for to walk with God. You must also understand that the things of the spirit has positions, conditions, progressions, and manifestations. If you are writing, for the sake of those who are writing, the things of the spirit has position. I have mentioned three positions of believers in Christ. We are seated with him. It is our position of rest. We are standing on the rock. It is our position of belief. We are walking. We have a walking position. It is our position where we journey from one realm of glory unto another. So the things of the spirit has position, condition, progression, and the manifestation. So you must walk. Your walk, you must walk by faith. You must walk by faith. You must walk by faith. It is important for every born again believers to walk. Walking. W A L K. That is what to do in Christ. We are not proving anything. We are only walking in the reality of what he has done and who he has called us to be. When you properly walk with God, which is only possible in Christ, the believers walk with God will produce fellowship, it will also produce assignment, and it will also produce provision. These are the three benefits of your walk with God. Your walk with God is going to provide a dimensions of fellowship that there is nothing that has happened that can pull you away from the reality of Christ. This is the realm Paul the Apostle was speaking and he says, shall principality death, nor angels, nor life. Nothing will be able to separate me from the love of God. It takes a dimension of fellowship in God to remain steadfast in Him, even though there are losses, even though there are tribulations, even though things that you are trusting God did not come. Habakkuk said there may not be oil in the vine, and then the, 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 the olive may not produce oil. He said, yet I will praise him. Job said, all the days of my appointed time will I wait until my change come. When you see people who are walking with God, the first benefit of their walk with God is that their fellowship with God becomes very stronger. Philippians 3 verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Let his mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who taught it not to be who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he submitted unto him, and he became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. Therefore God had highly exalted him, and given him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When you find someone who is walk with God has become so deep, you will find a man like John the Beloved, Revelation chapter 4. And I heard a voice that sounded like a trumpet. And he said unto me, Come up hither, and I will show you things that must be here after. The people that walk with God, the benefits of their walk with God always translate into deeper dimensions of fellowship. God shows them things. God reveals things to them. They know ahead before things happen. And if things happen without their understanding, they keep their work with God solid because they wouldn't want anything to separate them from God. The second benefit is that your work with God will always produce a life of assignment. When your work with God is genuine, an assignment is going to be produced out of your work with God. And the third one is that provisions. There will be provisions. He will do exceedingly, abundantly, above what you ever ask or think, according to the power that works in you. God shall supply all your need, according to his riches in glory, by Christ 
Jesus, they look unto him and they were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. I want to encourage you believers, let your work with God be solid. Let your work with God be genuine. Find a living church. Stay with scripture. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray on the daily basis. Pray in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Build up your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. To build up your most holy faith, you pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in understanding. Take time to meditate on the Word of God. Sit down and locate a sound teachers of the Bible who will teach you subject that you need to understand, who will build you up. Act of the Apostle 20 verse 32. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and provide inheritance for you among those who are sanctified. You must understand you are a child of God, but your growth is important because if you remain in a babyhood position, there are certain things you will not be able to fulfill as began God's preordained program for your life. I hope you are blessed today. God bless you. I'm going to come your way again on Friday where I will be teaching young ministers on the subject understanding teaching ministry. If you are led to support us, to support our foreign mission work here in the city of Toronto, I just want you to send me a message and I can give you details of how to be a blessing to us. We are Message of Light Chapel here in Canada, Toronto. And by the grace of God, every Tuesday is our apostolic Bible study online. Every Friday, I teach young ministers by 2 p.m. Ontario time and 7 p.m. West African time. Every Saturday is our physical meeting here in the city of Toronto. In case you are in the city of Toronto and you want to be part of what God is doing here, please send me a message. And then I want to tell you that these three services in a, meet, in a week, apart from every other things I do online, I would like to receive you, to pray with you. And then if you want me to counsel you, you can also send me a message. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. And the Lord cause his face to shine on you. It will strengthen your faith, build you up, equip you supernaturally, and then the lines are falling onto you in pleasant places, and you have a goodly heritage. God bless you. I will see you next week. Amen.